Africa, Myth and Reality, Social Science, Section 1. Africa is often referred to as the mother continent of humanity, for in the long term of human development, our oldest ancestors originated from Africa. Fossil, genetic, linguistic, and archaeological evidence confirm that all the members of your academic decathlon team, as well as those you are competing against, are your distant cousins. Your friends and all the people across the world are your extended family, global Africans. People have different appearances because their ancestors have lived in different environments. Over time, all life, including humans, physically adapts to its environment to survive. Humans who live near the equator, for example, developed darker skin to protect their body from the strong sun. The process of change in any species over time, which was first proposed by Charles Darwin, is called natural selection. Nature selects those most fit to survive. To put it a different way, if your body cannot adapt to its environment, you and others like you will die. Thus, race is biologically not possible. Of course, humans have different ethnicities, distinguished from one another by language, culture, and nationality. But the extraordinary fact of humanity's existence is our singularity, our family character, or to use our scientific description, our shared identity as homo sapiens. That you are human is a major lesson in life that Africa can teach us. Let us look at humanity's home another way. Imagine all human prehistory and history as a towering African baobab tree, with the Americas, Asia, and Europe making up major branches of that tree. Given our African origins, Africa would provide the trunk and roots to support the American, Asian, and European branches. Human history is African history. There are a series of different climate zones in Africa, which range from the wet tropical zone along the equator to Central Africa, and become drier as one moves to the north or south, resulting in large deserts in the interior of northern and southern Africa. The exceptions are coastal regions that get proportionally more rainfall than adjacent regions in the interior, and the East African coast, where the climate is, is isolated from the rest of Africa by a mountainous ridge and is most influenced by weather in the Indian Ocean. Generally, rainfall, or its absence, affects African climates more than any other factor. One of the most interesting features of climate change in Africa over the millennia has been the contraction and expansion of the Sahara Desert and its effect on life. More recently, researchers have discovered fossils of dinosaurs and bones of ancient peoples in the Sahara. Thousands of examples of Saharan rock art show long extinct animals drawn by ancient Africans remain visible today. Scholars have concluded that the expansion and contraction of the Sahara Desert over time led to innovations in food production, new forms of irrigation, migratory movements, and the formation of centralized states along the Nile and the Niger River to address the problems of increasingly dense populations. Historians of pre-colonial and colonial Africa are also interested in the interactions of pastoralists, animal herders, and farmers in the semi-arid Sahel region along the southern edge of the Sahara Desert and the influence of the Indian Ocean monsoons on East Africa. Other important climate factors include the impact of Africa's mountain range along its east coast and tropical regions where the high rainfall impeded land transportation. Characteristics of the African continent. Africa is the world's second largest continent, 11.7 million square miles wide and long. The continent of Africa is mostly a plateau with over 16,000 miles of coastline and 54 countries. Africa contains about 20% of the world's landmass. Some 20% of Africa is desert and about 15% is rainforest. Three United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, can fit on the African continent. One United States can comfortably stretch across North Africa's Sahara Desert. The Nile River, which begins south of the equator and flows northward, is about 4,160 miles long and is the world's longest river. The size of Africa, like the history of Africa, has been significantly, mi significantly misrepresented in the past by Western cartographers, who made it smaller compared with the rest of the world. Kai Krause attempted to correct the misconception of the relative size of Africa in the, ma in the map shown on the side. The Center for Geographic Analysis at Harvard University has created a far more complex and deep cartographic tool for academic use. Researchers designed an open source interactive map that overlays large databases of knowledge of Africa. It also contains six helpful base maps. You can plot national borders, overland trade routes, slave ports, language groups, and so on. Africa is larger than the US, China, Europe, and India combined. As a result, distances that need to be traversed are much longer in Africa than in Europe or the Middle East. One historical consequence of this was that it costs proportionately more to transport goods for trade, so only products of extremely high value with respect to their weight, like gold or spices, were profitable in pre-industrial Africa.
Otherwise, Africans generally relied on food they produced in their own region, rather than importing it from far away. Long distances and large land areas also meant that in most places, the African population was not very dense. The Nile River Valley was a notable exception. This lack of population density also allowed growing populations to find new land without having to fight for it and made control over people rather than land the basis for power and wealth. It also made it possible to grow food using methods that relied more on land than labor, such as slash and burn farming, which cleared new land with fire instead of applying fertilizer or rotating crops to restore productivity on existing farms. Low labor farming methods enabled even single families to become self-sufficient, so there was less pressure to form larger groups than in places where land was more limited. In a continent where long dry seasons and deserts placed limits on farmers and where heavy rains, rainy seasons limited travel in forested areas, rivers played an essential role in determining where and how humans lived and traveled. Africa has the world's longest river, the Nile, which flows for about 4,200 miles from the Central Africa um, region to the Mediterranean Sea, and the world's 10th longest, the Congo Zaire, which flows 2,718 miles from Central Africa to the, Indian, to the Atlantic Ocean. Two other major rivers are the Niger, which flows around 2,600 miles through West Africa to the Atlantic Ocean, and the Zambezi, which flows about 1,800 miles from Central Africa to the Indian Ocean. Many of the largest rivers are navigable for extremely long distances during the rainy season. For instance, the Niger River is navigable for more than 1,000 miles, roughly the distance between Philadelphia and Chicago. However, they all share one characteristic that makes them different from rivers in Europe or North America. All have rapids, also called cataracts, or waterfalls that prevent boats from sailing all the way to the sea. This is because the continent is basically a large flat table of fairly hard soil with relatively few mountains. Consequently, rainwater flows slowly toward the edge of the table and tumbles down the last stretch to the ocean. Although some rivers are navigable inland for short distances from the coast, navigation to the interior is impossible. Since the interior sections of most African rivers are navigable for long distances, they served as trade routes and food sources, which provided the means for larger states and larger populations to develop. As a consequence, the largest African populations developed in the interior, and the coast remained sparsely populated until the Europeans arrived. Although the continent is basically flat, there's a long stretch of mountains and plateaus high in eastern Africa, which was formed by collisions of two tectonic plates and a few older mountain ranges in western Africa that are mostly of volcanic origin. Since most travel took place on foot, the mountains were not usually a barrier to human contact. Instead, they offered islands that provided a base for people whose culture was often different from that of the flatlanders who lived in the plains and forests. The name Africa has not always been used to refer to the continent of Africa. The name was initially used limitedly to refer to Nor Roman northern Africa after the fall of Carthage in 146 BCE. The Arab conquerors of the 7th century referred to the same region as Ifriqiya. Subsequently, the name Africa was applied to the entire continent during and after the voyages of exploration in the 15th century by the Portuguese and other Europeans. Later, some Europeans began to use the word Africa to describe the other. Africa was so diminished in the European mind that the name Africa took on a demeaning connotation, suggesting Africans were primitive both in culture and quote-unquote race. In the early part of the 20th century, academics were strongly influenced by social Darwinists, who took Charles Darwin's ideas about the evolution of a single species and falsely applied them to human societies. These Eurocentrists argued that Western nations, which they believed were more advanced, were destined to rule those areas that they believed were less advanced. As apologists for empire, Europeans arranged Homo sapiens into races, with Africans being seen as a lesser race. As was mentioned earlier, race is a social rather than scientific construct. However, there is a great deal of ethnic diversity within Africa. If we use a broad definition of ethnic group, there are some 3,000 ethnic groups across Africa, each with its own language, dialect, and culture. Physically, Africans have great variety due to the continent's climate zones. Think for a moment about the diverse populations and subcultures that make up the United States today. Apply that to Africa on a much larger scale, and you will then have a better perception of the diversity and of the many peoples of Africa. Major West African ethnic groups include the Hausa, Yoruba, Igbo, Mande, Akan, and Fula. They are spread across several African countries because when Europeans drew boundaries, boundary lines for their African colonies in 1884 to 1885 at the Berlin Conference, they did not take into consideration African ethnic groups. Of those above, only the Igbo, about 28 million, of Nigeria are concentrated largely within a single African country. In contrast, the Mande, 
about 30 million, are spread across 13 African countries. The Hausa, about 60 million, who live across the Sahel from Ghana to Sudan, are the largest West African group of Muslims. You can see the locations and names of African ethnic groups using, the, using Harvard University's CGA maps. There are about 2,000 languages spoken in Africa, which fall into five major categories, Afro-Asiatic, Nilo-Saharan, Niger-Congo, including Bantu speakers, Khoisan, and Austronesian. Many Africans also speak Arabic or a European colonial language, most commonly English, French, or Portuguese. Arguably, the languages most interesting to Africanists who research human origins are those in the Bantu-speaking group, which are part of a larger Niger-Congo language family. Using advanced computer technology that can establish word relation relationships between the 1,600 Bantu languages, researchers have concluded that around 1,000 BCE, there was a population explosion near where Nigeria and Cameroon meet today. Over the course of centuries, the Bantu speakers expanded across the Sahel and southward in waves, reaching northern South Africa by about 500 CE. The Bantu-speaking ethnic group of Nelson Mandela, the Hosa, took on clicking sounds from the Khoisan peoples with whom they assimilated or whom they conquered as they moved south. The X in Hosa designates one of its many clicking sounds. Swahili, which denotes a language and a culture, is spoken by East Africans who are largely Muslim and were once involved in significant maritime trading networks of the Indian Ocean. Swahili culture extends from southern Somalia to northern Mozambique. The name Swahili derives from the Arabic word meaning coast. Swahili is primarily a Bantu language influenced by Arabic, Hindi, Persian, English, and Portuguese. You can see the locations and names of African language groups using Harvard's CGA map. The process of adopting culture is called centering, and it influences how people evaluate everything they encounter. Those who employ European beliefs and attitudes to view the world are called Eurocentric. Some of their ideas included allegiance to a national state rather than a human ruler, reliance on material science to solve problems, and the use of hierarchical structures to organize each individual's relationships to others in society. As a corollary, centric perspectives divide the world into things that are familiar and the other. This proved useful for Eurocentrists when it came to justify the transatlantic slave trade, imperialism, and colonialism. Western Myths About Africa Historically, much of what Westerners learned about Africa was affected by stories told by Europeans to justify slavery and colonial conquest, which in the United States led to Jim Crow laws that were enacted to deny newly freed slaves their civil and political rights. Western myths about, African, about Africa developed over the last 600 years and remain entrenched well into the 20th century. Marcus Garvey and Martin Luther King Jr., as well as many other civil rights activists and leaders, spent their entire lives working to dispel those myths. A representative source of Western fantasies about Africa is the important German historian and philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who wrote the following in his major work, Philosophy of History. Africa is not a historical continent. It shows neither change nor development. Its Negro peoples have been capable of neither progress nor education. As we see, as we see them today, so they have always been. More recently, the Regis Professor of Modern History at Oxford University, Hugh Trevor Ropper, enraged Africanists in 1963 when he claimed on the BBC that, perhaps in the near future, there will be some African history to teach, but at the present, there is none. There is only the history of Europeans in Africa. The present world is dom so dominated by Western European ideas, techniques, and values that for the last five centuries at least, in so far as history of the world has significance, it is only European history that counts. We cannot afford to amuse ourselves with the unrewarding gyrations of barbarous tribes in picturesque but irrelevant corners of the globe. Additionally, other notions of Africa have eased into our consciousness through popular culture. You may be familiar with certain images of Africa from Hollywood films and the media. Africa is sometimes portrayed as an exotic place of colorful costumes, strange customs and rituals, and unending revelry and festivals. Visions of local wildlife and Maasai warriors are the most used trope. Some movies show a wild and dangerous Africa of civil wars, warlords, and child soldiers. For Afro-pessimists, Africa is broken because nothing works. Daunting cultural and environmental and historical challenges plague the continent. Yet Africa's image in the West has not always been so negative. The Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle thought highly of Egypt and Ethiopia and considered these African states to be the most advanced nations on earth. Plato used Egyptian knowledge to create his program for education and teaching, 
ancient Greek traditions that held Africa in high regard remained placed in the West for more than 2,000 years, from the 700s BCE to the 1500s CE. Old Testament Hebrews, the Jews, concurred with the Greeks that Egypt was a place of advanced civilization. So what happened? The Atlantic slave trade and its rationalization by Europeans and Americans diminished the prestige of Africans. Those involved in and supportive of the slave trade argued that Black Africans never developed civilization and that any evidence of civilization in Africa was brought there by foreign invaders. Proponents of the slave trade also offered the spurious rationalization that Africans who were forced into chattel slavery in the New World were being rescued from their barbarism. Western myths about Africa were expanded further by attempts to diminish Egypt's contributions to world civilization and by categories in Egyptian civilization as being separate from quote unquote black Africa. This delusion flew in the face of Egyptian Mediterranean and inner African Trans-Sahara connection that had existed for many thousands of years. Regardless of the environmental hostility of the Sahara Desert, the highways across the desert were sustained, widespread, and reciprocal, much like the relationships ancient Greece and Rome had maintained with inner Europe. Some Western writers caricatured Africa as dark, alien, and evil, portraying it as a brooding jungle. Others described Africa as an open, sunlit land of noble savages. The most prolific European mythmakers about Africa were the British. Britain's imperial involvement in Africa led to a library of mythmaking about the British presence all over the continent. Until the 1950s, British literature about Africa usually conveyed a relationship of, of, a relationship of opposition between the image of the African and that of the Briton. For example, whereas the British were portrayed as brave, the Africans were shown as cowardly. Where the British were seen as dis disciplined, the Africans were thought to lack self-control. Where the British were civilized, the Africans were savage, and where British were good, Africans were evil. Seen through British eyes, Africa and Britain represented two poles of a single value system. While the British understood there were Africans in intermediate stages between the poles of civilization and savagery, 400 years of British writing about Africa produced a literature that described not Africa or Africans, but the British response to both. To British eyes, Africa remained the negative reflection of British self-image, partly to justify rule and partly to assert subjugation. Somewhat related to British power is an allegory about the relationship between British hunters and African lions. Often conveyed by African griots, teachers who conveyed oral traditions, this fable explains that because the hunters are the ones who write the books and tell the stories, the hunters are always shown as the ones who win. If lions wrote the books, they would at least occasionally win. The point here is that until the mid 20th century, most descriptions of Africa and Africans were written by Westerners, not Africans, and were about Western experiences in Africa rather than the Africans themselves or their cultures. European religion and myths about Africa. Roman Catholicism. Although, African, although Africa lies closer to Europe than any other continent except Asia, for a long period after the Roman Empire, there was little, little interaction between Europe and Africa because of conflicts between Muslims and Christians. By the time that contact was renewed in the 16th century, Europeans had developed their own ideas about how the world worked. Many of these ideas were embodied in Roman Catholicism, the religion of the late Western Roman Empire. During the centuries of chaos that followed Rome's fall, Catholicism provided explanations, order, and a basis for unity as Europeans reestablished governments, laws, and trade. As a result, when Europeans started to sail along the African coast in the late 15th century, they brought not only a fixed set of beliefs about the nature of humanity and its relationship to an all-powerful spiritual creator, they also believed they had an obligation to spread those beliefs and feared opposition from other religions. Europeans used force, forced conversions to Catholicism as a way to justify enslaving Africans. European Protestants, meanwhile, used opposition to Catholicism as a reason to extend their commercial activities to Africa. Calvinism. Calvinism, a sect of Protestantism credited to John Calvin, included beliefs about salvation and value that led to racist views towards Africans. Dutch Calvinists participated in the Atlantic slave trade, especially from Elmina Castle on the coast of Ghana, where about one million Africans began the Middle Passage to the New World. Dutch Calvinists, along with French Huguenots, carried similar views to South Africa. In the United States, the Pilgrims were also Calvinists. These groups of people believe that God chose them for a special mission, to share everlasting bliss in heaven with God. 
The original promotion of this idea, referred to as predestination, was actually first put forward by an African, Augustine of Hippo, who lived in what is now northwestern Algeria. Relying on Augustine, the Calvinists believed that for reasons only God understands, God predestined certain believers to share heaven with God. If you were not selected by God, then you cannot enter heaven, regardless of your prayers, good works, and exemplary faith. Even, individuals, even individual Calvinists were never certain they were one of the select, but at least they had a chance. They believed, for they were Calvinists, God select. Everyone else not destined for heaven was to serve those who were. This worldview had a decided impact on the Pilgrims' perspective on Native Americans and the Calvinists' perspective on Africans. The Calvinists were by no means the only group to hold racist views, but the Calvinist belief system nonetheless had an enormous influence in the United States and in Africa. The legacy of their intolerance remains, as they and others, religious and secular, helped nourish the foundation of racism so widespread towards Africa today. And the Atlantic slave trade. European beliefs justified a new kind of slave trade, chattel slavery, which proved particularly destructive. Africans had practiced slavery, but bondage within African societies which was quite different from chattel or property slavery of the West. African slaves in most African societies had rights. They could marry and raise families, and their children were often born free. They were not chattel of their masters to be bought and sold. Slaves in Africa provided both reproductive and labor functions, although at times they were killed to accompany their deceased masters in the underworld. African slavery could be quite appalling, but its cruelty was not on the same level as that of chattel slavery in the West. The Atlantic slave trade was horrific and complex. While some crews from, Af from European slave ships captured and enslaved Africans, most often Africans were captured and enslaved on shore by other Africans seeking profit or protection. African slaves sold to European slave ships were often captured in war and were often from other ethnic groups. Others were criminals or were given in an annual tribute to acknowledge the power of one African group over another. Whatever the immediate circumstances of enslavement, those in bondage were usually moved in groups from their interior to the coast, were often imprisoned in slave fort dungeons, and were sold in negotiations between their African captors and visiting slave ship captains. Depending on the time period, almost all slave ships originated from Spain, Portugal, France, England, United States, Holland, Norway, or Denmark. The ship captains would sail their ships to West African or Southwest African ports under African control and negotiate on board, on board or on shore. Once ship captains and African slave traders had concluded negotiations and brought the slaves on board, the middle passage would begin. Although statistics vary depending on the source, approximately 12.5 million Africans crammed and chained horizontally below stifling decks began the Middle Passage with about one to two million dying en route. Although European self-confidence left little room for Europeans to question their beliefs as more Europeans had contact with Africans, new ideas began to emerge. For example, John Newton, an English sailor and captain of slave ships who later became a clergyman and abolitionist, almost died in a major storm abroad the Greyhound in 1748. His harrowing experience led him to ask God for forgiveness for his many sins in return for accepting Christianity. At first, like many other Christians, including Calvinists, Newton did not denounce slavery. In fact, he participated in or led crews on five slave trading voyages and invested in others. Over time, however, he left the life of a sailor and became a minister. John Newton first published Amazing Grace as Faith's Review and Expectation, hymn number 41, in Only Hymns in 1779. It was not until 1788 that Newton published his influential anti-slavery tract, Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade. He lived just long enough to experience the Parliament of the United Kingdom's passage of the Slave Trade Act of 1807, which abolished the Atlantic slave trade in the British Empire, although slavery itself was still permitted. Afrocentrism. Seeing life through African eyes inside African culture and African environment is a good definition of Afrocentrism. You would expect Africans who have lived their lives in Africa and have been influenced by African culture to be Afrocentric in the same sense that most people who grow up in the United States are Eurocentric. Yet when the relationship between Afrocentrism and Eurocentrism is considered over the last 600 years, that link has had a very troubled history. Eurocentric people advocated for the Atlantic slave trade, imperialism, and colonialism in Africa, 
Eurocentrists viewed Africans as objects, impeding the European conquest for material gain, land, and labor. During the mid to late 20th century, two provocative scholars, Sheik Anta Diop and Martin Gardner Bernal, opposed Eurocentric views of Africa with significant scholarship. Both Diop and Bernal concentrated on Egypt, although from different perspectives, and in a general sense, their scholarship could be considered Afrocentric or African-centered. The African independence movements of the 1950s and 1960s also contributed to the effort to see African history through the African experience. Anta Diop. Sheikh Anta Diop was born in Senegal and educated in an Islamic school that followed the Murid teachings of Amadou Bamba. He carried out his advanced academic work at the University of Paris. Like Martin Bernal, Diab drew upon his deep interdisciplinary knowledge of history, linguistics, sociology, archaeology, colonialism, and Egyptology. Unlike Bernal, Diab also earned degrees in chemistry and worked in nuclear physics. He spent much of his life analyzing the relationship between ancient Egypt and West Africa, especially Senegal. His compatriots thought so highly of him they changed the name of Senegal's National University, Université de Dakar, to Université Sheikh Anta Diab. Much of Diop's research was driven by his desire to disprove Eurocentric notions that whites, not Africans, created the Egypt of the pharaohs. In many different published and unpublished works, Diop successfully overturned racist myths about pharaonic Egypt's alleged white origins. Diop's scholarship was complex and covered many disciplines, which he summed up in UNESCO's General History of Africa, the first multi-volume encyclopedic series about Africa from Afrocentric perspectives. While not all, all scholars agree with Diop's findings, he certainly removed Egypt from Eurocentric myth and placed it firmly within Africa. Martin Gardner Bernal. Martin Gardner Bernal, who like Diop sought to work against the legacies of European racism, imperialism, and colonialism, argued that some of the great wisdom of pharaonic Egypt contributed to the glory of ancient Greek civilization, the, Ath the Athens of Socrates, his student Plato, and Plato's student Aristotle. Using linguistics, ancient manuscripts, and archaeology, Bernal challenged Eurocentric academics to revise their understandings of the relationship between pharaonic Egypt and Greece. Many classicists and Egyptologists argue that there have been no substantial Egyptian contribution to Greek civilization. Countering that view, Bernal argued that ancient peoples had noted the connection between Egypt and Greece, but during the 19th and 20th centuries, Europeans severed that link because of notions of European imperial supremacy and pseudo-scientific racism, not because of new evidence. Bernal's argument was quite provocative, in part because he inferred that his academic opponents supported a racist interpretation. His critics also challenged his use of linguistics and his interpretation of art. Like Diop before him, Bernal helped place Egypt among the great civilizations of the world, one created by Africans. Together with other academics, Diop and Bernal helped to restore respect for Africa and its peoples, recovered significant portions of the African past, and enhanced African contributions to our common humanity. Sheikh Anta Diop and Martin Bernal spent much of their academic lives exploring the relationship between humans and Africa. Now that it is clear that all humans are descendants of Africans who migrated out of Africa about 50,000 years ago, humanity itself can now be centered. Section one of your resource guide has introduced you to evidence that supports Africa as the site of origin for human beings. You now have a better idea of the sheer size of the African continent, its varied climates, and its large number of ethnic groups, languages, and cultures. You also know that until the 1950s, much of what we knew about Africa was based on false assertions made by Europeans to justify slavery and colonialism. The rest of your resource guide is devoted to sharing with you the results of the enormous expansion in knowledge about Africa and its peoples that has taken place over the last 70 years.